All right, well, hey, Devonshire Church, it is so good to gather together today and uh, worship in our various places. Uh, this is the second week of doing this home edition for worship as we are unable to gather together uh, at our church building facility. And uh, that's okay because we know that the church isn't a building, but it, rather it's a people. And uh, as we gather together, um, in our various homes, maybe you're you're doing it on your own or you're meeting being able to meet with your Family your roommates or whoever that is and I hope that Already our time together has been meaningful and helpful in just helping us Point our thoughts and our hearts towards the Lord in this time This morning as we begin our time together and looking at God's Word I just want to share a story from probably about 20 years ago. I think I've, I've shared this before but I want to share it because I've titled this message, Don't Miss the Opportunity. And uh, about 20 years ago, I was down in Honduras We had with uh, about three other guys, and we were taking a trip there to check out uh, the situation that we wanted to t bring some teams to, to just come alongside our brothers and sisters there in uh, ministering. And, uh, and we came to our, the end of our time, and we got back to the airport there in San Pedro Sula, and we checked our luggage, we got up to the, um, to the waiting area where everybody boarded the planes, and we sat there and waited for our, our plane to show up and for us to be able to, to take the trip home. We were sitting there and we sat there for quite some time. You know how it is in airports, you get there um, way in advance of when you actually leave so you don't miss the flight. Well, the time came and it went, and uh, us not being very good at listening to or understanding Spanish, it's not none of our native tongues, we missed the call for us to um, board our plane. And we were thinking, boy, it is about time for us to fly home and why aren't they calling us? And we just missed it. And we look out the window and there's this big plane that's taken off and it was like, that looks like that could be our plane. And sure enough, it was. It was our plane and there we were sitting in the waiting area at the terminal and we missed our flight. And missing our flight led to a whole bunch of other stuff. We made it home, obviously, um, but we ended up having to reschedule, get on another flight that was whole separate from where our luggage was going. And because it was an international flight, our, we weren't there to pick up our bags so that, to transfer them to the next flight. Um, on the way home to Dulles where we left our car and so it was late at night whenever we got back to uh, Dulles there outside of DC and we showed up and we couldn't come home because the keys to the car that we had left there were in our suitcases that were somewhere else I think it was Houston at that time and so we were stuck and someone had to drive the whole way down um, an hour and a half to give us a key so that then we could drive home and it was the early morning hours uh, that we finally got home and uh, we were in the, in it, oh and it was a blizzard that we were driving through uh, to get home that night it was really hard it was not the best and all of that happened because we missed our flight this morning I want to talk a little bit about not missing the opportunity um, as we continue our upside down series that we're journeying through here from Lent towards Passover and Resurrection Sunday. I want to ask you, have you ever missed an opportunity? I'm sure you have. There's all kinds of opportunities that we miss all the time. And last week, as we looked at John chapter 13, we were t learning about the story about whenever Jesus was seated at the table, and here I am at the table in our home, uh, for the Last Supper. And he demonstrated his love for his disciples, and we talked about how he did that as he washed their feet, and they, he then told them that this is how I want you to love each other. And while he was doing that, he washed the feet even of the one who was going to betray him. And so today, we want to look a little bit closer at the story of Judas and look at his life and, and to help us think through what that may have been like. Uh, I want you to watch this and what he might have been going through and thinking through at that time. I thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. There was this time we were at a party and some woman comes in and pours a whole bottle of perfume, expensive perfume, 
all over him because she thought he was the one. What a waste. We could have sold the perfume and used the money for some better purpose. And I told him as much. He comes back at me insinuating that he, he was the purpose. Even so, I believed he was the one, the one who was going to turn things upside down. I just knew it. I tried to help him see it, but he wouldn't listen to reason. My time has not yet come. That's what he kept telling me. His time had not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising the dead. He was healing blind people. He was producing food out of thin air. People would have followed him anywhere. All he had to do was say the word, but he wouldn't do it because his time had not yet come. Well, I forced his hand. I forced his time to come. Things needed a push, and I was the only one who had the courage to do it. He looked, he looked right across the table at me and said, get on with it. How did he know what I was going to do? And it wasn't about the money. It's just, how can he not leverage what he's got to, to help forward our agenda? I mean, people listen to him. You know how the waves sound when they hit the shore and it's quiet for a few seconds after the water settles? That was Jesus. He spoke and it was like moving, rolling water. The crowds listening, they were the hush at the end of the wave. And the things he said, there was no doubt in anyone's mind. He was the one. Was he the one? Dear God, what have I done? Well, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. That's what we're going to be reading through uh, this as we continue the story there of, of what happened at the Last Supper. And we look and we want to look closer at Judas and, and what he did and what was going through and what can we learn from him. And so let's read this together, John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. John writes this, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered him, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus, Ju, Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we come to uh, your word now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that we would be open to hearing what it is that you have to say to us now. Lord, we need to hear from you, and in these days, Lord, uh, Lord, would you speak to us and help us to understand, Lord, what it is that you're calling us to and what you're leading us to in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, here Jesus is on the night in which he is betrayed, and after spending time with those, his disciples who he had spent time with over the previous past three years, there he is, and he's reclining at the table with them these who are his closest followers, and he tells them as he looks around the table and he says, one of you is going to, be betray is going to betray me. And I'm sure that everyone around that table is, is taken off guard by what he is, is saying there because who could it be? And so Peter, he tells who we believe to be John, as it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, 
Um, he says, hey, John, I want you to ask, ask him, who's he talking about? And Jesus says, it's to the one, the one whom I give this piece of bread is the one who is going to betray me. And he gives it to Judas and he says, go do what you're going to do and do it quickly. Guys, you probably know the story of Judas. He, in fact, leaves that meal. He goes to the chief priest and he makes a deal for 30 pieces of silver with them to betray Jesus and take them to the place where he knew that Jesus was going to be. And with the sign of a kiss on Jesus' cheek, Jesus was then arrested and led to be crucified on a cross. Judas is that disciple who is forever known as a traitor, as one who betrayed Jesus. He's the one who is known, and think about it, that there's a lot of people who have a lot of the disciples' names, like there's a lot of Johns out there, there's Marks out there, there's Peters out there, there's even some Lukes out there, uh, there's Bartholomew, there's Barts out there. But how often do you run into someone named Judas? Think about this. Judas is often painted as this treacherous, this dark person. And like he's someone that we, we would never be found around. But I want you to think about this and maybe consider how maybe Judas isn't so much unlike you or like, unlike me in some ways. Think about this. Back in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, we're told that Jesus, he prayerfully and he intentionally picked each one of his disciples, of which Judas was one of these guys. At that point, he wasn't a traitor. He wasn't someone who was looking to betray a close friend. He probably seemed like an average guy like you and like me. He had all the potential that each of the others had. But not only did he have the potential, but the amazing thing and the privileged thing that he had was that he had the privileges that came with one of Jesus' disciples. He had a front row to Jesus' teaching. He got to see the miraculous things that Jesus did, the miracles that he performed. He had walked and talked with Jesus. He had eaten with Jesus. He had been given opportunities of ministry along with the other disciples. There had been so much that he had experienced. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be a disciple of Jesus like Judas? got to experience that. And he was trusted, we're told, by the other disciples as being trustworthy. As we heard the other week, whenever Mary came and anointed Jesus' feet, and even in the passage today, it tells us that he was the guy who had been given the responsibility of being in charge of the money bags. And so just think of all of that. He had the position of being in Jesus' presence, the privilege of getting to see firsthand and hear all that Jesus did. And he was trusted by the other disciples. Think of all of that. What an opportunity he had. At least that's how he started out, right? He had just as much opportunity as the rest of that close-knit group. But when it came down to it at the end of the day, what did he do? But he betrayed his friend. How does this happen? How does it happen that someone goes from being like he was with all of those opportunities and with all of that privilege and with the position and being a trustworthy guy to being a guy who turns and betrays Jesus. I think there's a few things that come to mind. One of them is that there were unmet, unmet expectations. We don't have too many glimpses of Judas's life specifically, but as the years were going by, could it have been that G Judas got frustrated, that he got disillusioned, that he was disappointed in the direction that he saw Jesus' plan going as the Messiah? Were there unmet expectations? When he saw that things weren't going in the direction that he expected that they should, even after the feeding of the 5,000, even after Jesus walked on the water, Jesus says this to his disciples after many who had been following after him heard a hard saying. In verse 66 of chapter 6, to the end of that chapter, here's what Jesus says after people leave him. He says this, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And so Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and, and have come to know that you are the one, that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. 
And he spoke of Judas and si- of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Like there, Jesus knew that he was going to betray him. But maybe Judas, did he have ideas of some earthly kingdom that that's what he was looking for rather than the spiritual kingdom that he was coming to hear about and understand that that's what Jesus was talking about and he disagreed with the direction that this miracle worker was going? Was Judas already thinking through these things and Jesus knew it? But not only might there have been unexpectations, but another window that we're given into Judas's life was at the dinner party that was thrown for Jesus by Martha and Mary and Lazarus back in Bethany. We looked at this the other week whenever Mary came and she anointed Jesus' feet with an expensive perfume. And we're told that Judas is the one who speaks up. And Judas is the one that says, why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he was the one in charge of the money bags that he used to help himself to what was put into it. Do you see what he does? Not only does it seem like there is the building up of unmet expectations, but there's also this sense of hypocrisy and greed that's hidden underneath this show of looking like this was a really nice and caring guy because he wants to care for the poor. And his heart is being revealed and then we're told that while others are trusting him, to honestly take care of the money. He's there and he's helping himself dishonestly to it, to use it for his own things. And then this is what brings us to the passage that we have before us that leads him going to the chief priest and the officers before he betrays Jesus. Do you see how this all happened? Little by little, on the outside, everything looks like it's okay. At the beginning, all the appearances are of that of all the other disciples that Jesus had chosen. He was even viewed as trustworthy by the other disciples. But little by little, I believe there was some disillusionment, there was disappointment, there was frustration, there was some greed, there is selfishness, maybe even fear of what was to come that wasn't kept in check. And there was this slow fade to the point of, as the gospel writers say it, that Satan There was an opening for Satan to enter into him. And what does he do? But he goes and he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And he does it with a kiss. There's a story told of an an artist who was commissioned to paint a Sicilian cathedral. A mural depicting the life of Jesus. And he discovered in the process, whenever he started that out, he found a 12-year-old boy who was radiant with innocence and he was a model for the Christ child and so as the years went on years later the artist had developed the mural to the events of Holy Week with major figures completed and and the only person they didn't have completed was this disciple Judas and so one afternoon a man showed up with the results who had the results of excessive drinking and he staggered into a tavern where this artist was sitting And immediately the artist saw him and said, this guy, this guy who's a drunkard will fit perfectly for the model that I need of someone to be Judas. And so what he did was he led the man to the cathedral. He pointed to the bare space on the wall and he asked him to pose for Judas. And the drunkard broke out and sobs. He says, don't you remember me? Don't you remember me? And he pointed to the Christ child And he explained, I was your model for him a whole bunch of years ago. How's this happen? Guys, Judas had all the opportunity and the privileges one could want, didn't he? But in the end, Matthew tells us that he ended up betraying a friend and ending his life in remorse. How does this happen? Friends, along the way, there are so many opportunities. And this morning, I want to encourage you to not miss the opportunity that we have right before us right now. There's three opportunities that I want to point to. One is that there's the opportunity for us to grow in trust. Are you disappointed with life? Are you disillusioned with how things have turned out? Maybe this is where you find yourself right now. Things have not gone at all as you expected or had hoped, as you planned on. Maybe your prayers, they don't seem to be 
answered quite like you had hoped that they would be right now. There's the loss and there's this pain and you're starting to look for someone or something else rather than trusting in Jesus. Maybe going through these days with the measures that have been taken with the pandemic have gotten in the way of how you thought life was going to go or should go. And with that there, and with that, there is great disappointment and frustration. And so how are you going to handle that? Where are you going to turn? Will you still, in the midst of disappointment and frustration, follow and trust in Jesus? Or will you turn away from him and try to take matters into your own hands? The other opportunity that I don't want us to miss out on is that this, there is an opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity for repentance and to repent. Judas, at every turn that we get a glimpse into his heart and his actions, had the opportunity to turn in repentance and turn to admit to Jesus his need for forgiveness. And we know that Jesus, at any moment, he would have been ready to forgive. And here's the thing that we see in Judas and what we know about every single one of us. That on the outside, things can look all fine and well, but on the inside, there is something going on. And there is a need daily for repentance before a holy God. As the lyrics of the old hymn say, Come thou fount of every blessing, that him, they say, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, whether it's pride, whether it's gluttony, whether it's lust, anger, greed, or sloth, there is plenty for us to be aware of and the very real sp spiritual battle that we are fighting against the enemy. And so in these days, friends, I believe that there has been a time of stripping away in our lives stripping away of conveniences, stripping away of things that have been allowed to take the place in our lives to the level that we need to repent of them. It might be that we found satisfaction and an, an unhealthy confidence in financial stability, maybe in materialism, maybe in our jobs, maybe in our social interactions, in our roles, roles the list can go on and on. And now in some ways, these things may be getting stripped away and we find that those things aren't sufficient, but that only our Savior is worthy of being our hope. Judas missed the opportunity to turn in repentance. In these days, friends, things have slowed down, and we've been asked to distance ourselves through this pandemic. And friends, let's get on our knees, and let's cry out in repentance and trust. And let's turn in our hearts to the Lord in total dependence for his mercy. And so let's not miss the opportunity for repentance here. And lastly, let's not miss the opportunity to give generously and to care for those that the Lord has put around us. As I reflect on Judas's character and his heart, selfishness and concern for his wants or what stick out to me, Jesus wasn't turning out to be the kind of Messiah that he wanted him to be. Mary wasn't using exper expensive perfume the way that he thought it should be used. He was helping himself dishonestly for his own gain out of the money bag. And maybe in his betrayal of Jesus, he was even working out of concern for himself due to fear that, of what was to come and the little bit of money that he had to deal with. And each step along the way, there was this opportunity for him to give himself and desires unselfishly for the sake of others. Which is in fact what we saw demonstrated by Jesus as he washed our feet just moments before this. And as he gave himself sacrificially on the behalf of sinners. Friends, times like these can bring out the best and they can bring out the worst in some of us. Throughout these past weeks there have been stories of people hoarding and up maybe things like hand sanitizer and toilet paper and all kinds of items but more than they really need and it's a good and it's a natural thing to take care of oneself that's important but then there's a point where it's taken too far and it's driven by a selfishness and a lack of concern for others church i want to encourage you let's not miss the opportunity to give and to be generous let's not miss the opportunity to be the church of Jesus Christ that, that were his hands and feet in these days.
I love it. Over these past week, I've heard stories of people reaching out and caring for their neighbors in different ways. Some people have, I heard of one person who, who cooked up their family's uh, favorite recipe of, of chicken pot pie and they took it over to their neighbor. I've heard stories of people who took cookies over and, and just took them out to, to various people's homes and dropped them off. I've heard people checking in and asking and making sure people are doing well. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about serving and loving. And so let's not miss the opportunity to be generous. You know, we're just stewards of what God's given us. And we can hold things either with clenched fists or we can hold them with open hands. And if we hold things with open hands, then God's able to put more into our hands. But if we hold things with clenched fists and hold them on too tightly, he can't put more in our hands. And so let's be generous and let's be willing to have open hands. I love it that this week Kylie gave me a call and she said, hey, you know, what are we doing? What can we do for our, our first responders and our healthcare providers and, and, and those healthcare professionals who are, who are that first line uh, against this um, virus at this time? And so we talked it out and we came up with some ideas. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to be a part of that, sign up today. Tomorrow we want to get started on that. But here's my question for you. And here's what I want to encourage you. Church, let's not miss this opportunity to be a blessing on your street and in your neighborhood and with those who are near to you. Because we have a choice. And let's not miss the opportunity that we have in these days that are like none other in our lifetime. And let's grow in our trust in the Lord. Let's fall on our knees in repentance and turn back to the Lord. And let's take full advantage of the opportunity that we have to be generous and give to others. And so here's my question for you today. Will you trust Him? Will you repent? And will you give? Or do we let Him change us? Are we going to let Him change us? Or will we say, Lord, Lord, maybe like Judas did but fail to do the things that he asked. And so let's not miss the opportunity that we have for these upside down days. All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we have together today. And we thank you for the opportunities that you have blessed us with and you put right in front of us. And right now, even though it is a difficult time, it's a hard time, Lord, there are opportunities that abound. All around in it and there are things that you're calling us to do and absolutely Lord you're calling us to trust you and so help us to come to you fully trusting in you and you alone every moment of every day Lord you've given us the opportunity to turn in repentance Lord search our hearts you know our hearts you know if there are, you know any wayward thing that is in our hearts Lord God would we turn and repentance to you and find forgiveness and grace and mercy and Lord finally God would we continue to be the church that is graciously giving and generously giving uh, to those who are around us in love and care just as you have loved us Lord we thank you and we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus name Amen, Amen. well thanks for listening in guys uh, be praying for you this week as you go throughout it and uh, I want to encourage you if you're able to to check in to uh, the prayer meeting on Wednesday night and also uh, sign up for the Discipleship Explorer course and uh, those are both on Wednesday night and any the other stuff that is listed in the email that you receive and uh, so have a great week and we'll see you soon